Uh, okay, so, so thank you. I recognize it's after lunch and uh, it gets a little bit more difficult as the day goes on. So I had a meeting in Midtown and I was walking up here at about 1230 and I, I crossed through Times Square. Uh, tremendous mistake. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching uh, Wonder Woman and Elmo and Captain Jack Sparrow and uh, out of nowhere, Iron Man has got all of these people surrounding him and they're taking the pictures. And, you know, of course, they're tourists and they want to get paid. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, Elmo is like a crowd pleaser for the kids. Who doesn't love Captain Jack Sparrow? Minnie and Mickey are legacy favorites, and yet Iron Man is killing it. So why is he succeeding in the same environment as everybody else? Uh, so what I come to realize is he's working the crowd more. I watch him for about a minute. He's working the crowd more, and he's got lollipops. <laughs> so the first thing that goes through my head as a, as a parent of two young kids, who in God's name would let their kid eat that lollipop? But nevertheless, he's doing the same job as everybody else, and I would venture to guess that he's probably killing it somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 1 uh, across everybody. So as we recruit people, uh, my deal for the next 20 minutes or so is going to be like, what separates the wheat from the chaff? And as recruiters, are you recruiting as a transactional moment in time to put a butt in a seat? or are you thinking about the long-term health of the organization and growth and fit? So Sasha and Kristen spoke about an hour ago in the other room. Uh, I thought you did a nice job, both of you. And, um, and I'm gonna build on that uh, in terms of cultural alignment and fit and also the use of tools. So, uh, but I'm curious, how many here, show of hands, everybody recruits here? or is involved in some capacity, great. And do you, is there just kind of people throw out a couple of things, like what drives success in the recruitment process? What's a successful candidate have that a mediocre or a less successful candidate doesn't have? Passion, Passion cool, like that. Something else? Adaptable. Adaptable, adaptability, great, love it. Yes? Great, autonomous, self-motivated. Right, great. Lifelong learners, curiosity. Yeah, okay, good. So nobody said um, they have all the requisite experiences. Nobody said that they're competent at managing with others or effective communications. Again, it's all the soft skills. I'm again building off your guys' presentation from earlier uh, as to what makes somebody successful or mediocre or fail in the organization. And one of the things I would uh, try to impress upon you is don't, don't hire for the moment. Hire for the firm and hire for your culture and for growth. And there's a few couple quintessential elements that I'll talk about that, that Corn Ferry believes are really those key drivers for ultimate success. And there are a lot of what everybody in the room just said moments ago. I like this one. So 90% uh, of us believe that we are in the top 10% of our organization. Anybody here not in the top 10% of their organization? Uh, the other thing, I think it's easy to get caught up in what's the difference between high performance and high potential. So Corn Ferry Institute, we've got about 50 IOs. We've got um, statisticians, PhDs, researchers, all the smart people are, are in that uh, department. And so they tell me that only 29% of people that are deemed high performers are actually high potentials. So there's a little bit of, is it the Peter principle, Patrick? Or is it the Patrick principle, Peter? Oh, yeah. Patrick. Okay, fine. We'll go with the Patrick principle. You know, we all rise to our level of ineptness. And so I think just because somebody is awesome in what they're doing today, they're not necessarily awesome in what you promote them to do tomorrow. So as somebody is successful, are, again, are you taking a look at them to understand that's great. We want them to continue to be successful if we do move them up. Are they one of the 29% or are they one of the 71%? All talent is not created equal. And, you know, my boss will say, oh, parts are parts. You know, if a marketing person gets hit by a bus, just get another one. Um, and, and I don't think that that's um, reality. 
so according to this slide here from uh, our, our wonderful competitors at the Corporate Executive Board, they, uh, their research would show that top performers produce 10 times more than the average worker and they require less than two times the pay. And so oh, maybe that's, that's actually from Sullivan. Corporate Executive Board says that superstars produce up to 12 times more than the average employee. So when we think about a Goldman Sachs, we think about McKinsey, we think about Google, we think about Apple, their ability to attract the superstars because of the brand, because of the manpower, because of the intellectual rigor in which they put people through in the recruitment process creates more superstars there. At the same time, the best people have options. So 47% of high performers are out there looking, 47% of your high performers while you're sitting in this room are out there looking for a job right now. Uh, so how are you gonna keep them? 25% of the middle performers stay and 18, or I'm sorry, are looking and only 18% of the low performers are looking. So how are you not left with an organization of mediocrity? I used to keep, teach my, or uh, coach my kids uh, baseball team and it was a travel team and all of the best kids were constantly being recruited by the other towns and the other damn dads for their teams and all I was left with was you know Johnny two left feet who couldn't feel the ground ball to save his life so you know so again if all talent is not created equally sure uh, you know I need some not everybody needs to be a superstar we need to get stuff done, but again, are we thinking about people and putting them in slightly different buckets? Again, is, is to onboard them, to attract them, to retain them, to develop them. Again, I think you got to uh, separate the wheat from the chaff, uh, stay close to top talent, develop, develop everybody to maximize their contribution, but um, it's kind of the 80-20 rule, spend most of your time uh, influencing your talent development departments. Um, to really focus on those that you know are going to make a big difference. This is a boring slide. Um, so best in class companies, what do top companies do? Okay, one, they have, a, you know, this is like common sense stuff. So they have a plan. So is the talent strategy aligned to the business strategy? It's amazing how many um, CHROs that I'll, I'll meet with and um, I'll say, okay, so, so how is your talent strategy aligned to the strategy of the organization? Every organization, every board of directors spends, I mean, how much is a McKinsey consulting gig cost? It's gotta be, you know, 40, $50 million for a Fortune 500 firm. They spend a ton of money to get the strategy right and then how much time do they actually spend on the people part of the execution? Far less. So our old boss, CEO, used to say that strategy is 10% strategic thinking and 90% execution. So really that model should be reversed. We should be spending 90% of the time thinking about our people and 10% of the time thinking about our strategy. Okay, uh, rigorous and consistent. I, I mean, have a process, have a plan. I thought it was cool what Mel talked about, and I can't believe Mel's not in the room, um, that they, they created all this process, thank you. Uh, that they had none beforehand. Again, that they were just sort of hiring on an ad hoc basis. I think the other big thing is, is like use the tools. It's amazing to me, I've, I've been you know, sort of asking around and we've done a little bit of research at Cord Ferry, how many people use pre-hire assessment at the white collar level from entry level college grad all the way up to the board of directors. Uh, we're finding something like 70% uh, do not use a pre-hire assessment. It's kind of like digging a ditch without a shovel or taking a trip without a GPS or a map or something like that. If the tools and big data and talent analytics have evolved to a place today that are pretty sophisticated and statistically valid and cheap, then why the heck wouldn't you use them? And so Sasha and I will vary a little bit in his opinion that it's, that it's what I say about the tools is, is that they should validate the gut feel. So he could teach you some great exercises in terms of, of how to ask people probing questions to get it fit, cultural alignment, organizational citizenship, things of that nature. But why not use that tool to validate the gut check? Have a plan, stick to the plan, align the plan to the business strategy, and, uh, and don't, don't defer. We're not gonna get into this, we don't have time, but, but I would like to talk a little bit about our model. So we've, um, so we're billion two uh, in revenue and about 50% of that comes from non-executive search these days. Leadership development, talent management, coaching, things of that nature. 
we've acquired a, a number of different companies and we asked those, those social scientists to go in a room and come up with a model that we can measure whether it's a person, a team, a department, a country, a business unit, an age band, a title, a uh, job class, family, whatever it is, come up with a model where we can understand what makes the person uh, and whether they'll be successful in this role and what might that look like in, in the years ahead. So I like to think about it this way. The thing that gets us the job is what we've done in the past, okay? And that's the stuff that we didn't talk about when I asked you what makes somebody successful. So it's what are you competent in and what experiences have you had in the past uh, that will drive future performance. Um, as important, if not more important, is kind of who we are as individuals. So what's our personality like and what are we all about? And then finally, what are we driven for? So what are we playing for? in our own career. Some of us are driven by power. Some of us are driven by legacy. Some of us are driven by making a difference. And so if we could take the bias out by understanding who people are as much as what they're capable of doing, the improvement on the fit and the ultimate success of those people goes up dramatically. So like in a nutshell, I say on the recruiting front, you get hired for what you know and you get fired for who you are. Not gonna do that, not gonna do that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about personality. So we got this new tool, it's based on those four dimensions, the Corn Ferry four dimensions of talent and leadership. This is the iPad version of once we start to assess our candidates through the recruitment process. Uh, Corn Ferry believes that there are, we, we talked about it at the onset, what are the big things that drive success of an individual after placement? So with regards to personality, we believe there's three, social leadership, energy, and agility. So social leadership, the days of command and control, the maniac boss, uh, hierarchical organizations is long gone. I think obviously when you look at the leaders today who are driving um, some of the most dynamic companies in the world, whether it's Fred Cook or Tony Shi at Zappos, um, did I say Tim or Tom Cook? Doesn't matter, Tim Cook, Tom Cook, it's Patrick's brother, he doesn't know. So, mm. Fred Cook is actually at a uh, PR firm. He runs Fleshman Hillard, I think. In any event, um, social leadership. You want somebody who is a great communicator, who can deal uh, with very diverse audiences, who has an open and informal, approachable style in terms of a leadership role. Energy never goes out of style. There, again, there's simple tools to, you know, I can offer some really good ones if you need a source, but whether you use Corn Fairies or somebody else's for a hundred bucks or whatever it costs, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of foolish not to. Uh, but the big one is agility. So again, Corn Fairy research would indicate that agility is the number one predictor of overall career success. So my single greatest, Sasha, what was the thing that you left people with if they're gonna do one thing? Oh, was to use your, the SBO model? Sasha can tell you about that over cocktails later. If there's one thing that Corn Ferry would tell you about the recruitment process, it's to hire the agile. So what is the agile? They're adaptable, they're lifelong learners, they are insatiably curious, they are comfortable with risk, they create the new and the different. And if we don't think that every business model isn't transforming uh, itself on a regular basis, we're nuts. So the question is, is you, know, you wanna find the disintermediators who are comfortable disintermediating your own company to keep your own company around. How do you find them? And then as you attract more agile executives or professionals or individual uh, contributors, then you know, what, what happens with them? So firstly, our research would indicate that they get uh, promoted twice as fast as individuals with medium to lower levels levels of agility. We also find that they are five times like, more likely to be highly engaged, and we know that highly engaged employees are more productive and satisfied, and they stay longer, and they move up, and all that good stuff. And then ultimately, for your CFO, you could tell him or her that the companies who have the greatest number of highly agile people 
outperform in terms of EBITDA by uh, up to upwards of 25% and a profit margin. So we're just not, we're not making this stuff up. I mean, you know, we've got 2.5 million assessed executives that we've looked at. I think we know what great looks like and we can compare again, whether it's one executive versus another or a company versus a different company, hire the agile. What else could I tell you? Nah, that stuff's all boring. Um, let's talk about user experience. I think that um, this is the other thing. Uh, I think a lot of these tests and assessments that we're put through, and I'm, I'm not going to name any names or, or, or criticize any particular companies, but they're built by IO psychologists. And it's been my experience that they're built by IOs for IOs, and they're god awfully boring and they're monotonous, and they don't often give your candidates any feedback in terms of how they did. It's like a big secret. Like, so you just gave me 45 minutes of your life, you psychoanalyzed me, I know you know stuff about me now, and you don't tell me anything. So I believe we, we live in this world today where we're swiping left and right for everything, whether we're going to the movies, looking for a date, no, no judgment, John, I'm not singling you out for anyone. Okay, fine. Looking for a date or uh, planning a vacation. And, um, and so why, as HR professionals, like why would our stuff in this world today uh, be so god-awfully boring and have a horrible user experience? So I think, and guys like Recruitify, I think are exemplifying this, is that they're bringing a much newer, technologically advanced, fun kind of process to old, antiquated HR systems. And I think those are going to be, be the people who disintermediate and win. So for us, the adage that I use with our developers and, and uh, again, social scientists is that everything Corn Ferry does, it has to be Angry Birds meets the boardroom. So it's got to play at the highest levels of an organization, but it's got to be engaging at the lowest levels of the organization. It's got to be simple. And so CHRO earlier this week of a Fortune 20 company told me, yeah, but um, is it too simple? And, is, and are you being a little too flip in sort of, we need to hire people who are really going to drive this organization um, so have you gamified or are you suggesting that just making everything fun, does that discount the science? And so um, it was a really good question. So we did a little homework and UCLA has done a study where they found that everything that we do in life, whether we're buying a cheeseburger or uh, having a conversation with our best friend or again going on vacation, 7% is based on the content, like what's in the cheeseburger, or what's the topic I'm talking about with my best friend, and 93% of our decision-making um, uh, decision period is based on the experience. So 93% experiential and 7% science. So find great science and then give it to people in a way that improves your employer brand. And I would also suggest that when you assess people, if you assess people, give those candidates something back as well. Some people say, well, does that open us up for legal stuff, blah, blah, blah. The reality is, is you're not comparing them against the benchmark. You're not saying, hey, you came in sixth. What you are saying is this is your strengths and these are a few areas for you to develop yourself. Thank you for that hour of your time. Unfortunately, there were a few other candidates that meet the requirements a little bit better, both due to that assessment, but also in our references and our interviews and everything else. Um, but it leaves a much better taste in their mouth in terms of that candidate intimacy that all of us need to build as, again, as we know, we're fighting for talent. Uh, and it's only going to get harder as, as the years go on. So um, hire the agile, be kind to candidates, and uh, go get a lollipop from Iron Man. Thank you. Good job.